Okay, very good. Well, this is really a continuation of last week's message because I found that to cover things adequately required a fair bit more time than I'd originally hoped. So for those who weren't here last week, I think it would be helpful to recap a couple of things before we move on with this this is a, this fundamental and fascinating prophecy in Daniel. So we're actually in Daniel 9. That's the passage we're going through. But as I mentioned before, it's been called the backbone of prophecy because this is the passage when properly understood can help put everything in its right place. And if you on the back of your sheet, you'll see a line thing kind of down there and it, um, it's kind of like a backbone in a sense. But you'll see as, you, as we go why that is. And incidentally, just, just to be clear, since I mentioned about the Bible being properly understood, I'm going to take the approach for this passage that I always take in preaching, and that's just trying to convey what's God trying to say through this passage. That's all I'm trying to do, is convey what God has revealed to us in his word there. And I'll do that to the best of my ability today, as usual, but where I fall short, please do look up more other gifted speakers if you want more, but um, there are plenty around. Um, But anyway, last time we saw how Jesus himself points to Daniel 9 as pivotal to getting your head around around the end times and how it all fits together. So we'll go to Matthew 24, 15 to 16. You'll see Jesus pointing us to this passage. He says, So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And the idea of the abomination of desolation comes from this Daniel 9 passage, plus another place in Daniel as well. So it does help us, even today, to look at this. Hopefully that becomes more obvious as we go. Uh, Because even though it's written to Israel and about Israel, the whole world is affected by the events described in this passage. Now, last time I did some maths, just to warn you, this week there is still a little bit more maths. In fact, there's probably a fair bit more maths. And I know that's not everyone's cup of tea, but for those whom it is, I can, this can certainly be a huge faith boost when you see how everything does fit. Think of it kind of like, just just because someone doesn't get a kick out of fishing, doesn't mean they're going to stop everyone else from going fishing, right? Because um, it's it's not how it works. And put it more in the context of our family, Steph has no interest in watching the AFL at all, or cricket or anything really, anything fun. I'm joking. Um, no, she's not here. I shouldn't have said that. Sorry. No, but she openly doesn't like the AFL. And, um, but she doesn't stop us boys from watching it and, and having a bit of fun. So it's kind of like that. So be like my wife. There you go. How's that? Um, but I think my enjoyment of the AFL will depend on how woke they choose to get, I think. But anyway, that's how the future goes. But my point is the stuff that Jesus talks about here and what Daniel reveals in chapter 9 of his book has potential to really help some people, so that's why we're digging into it today. And anyway, even if it's not that exciting for you, or you know, it's still, like we said, the backbone of prophecy, so it's good to know. At least be aware of it. Okay, first I want to just revisit something I kind of uh, messed up last week because I just sort of spoke off, off my notes about the time King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, it became sort of like an animal for a period of time. So I just want to clarify that, firstly, so there's no confusion, but also because I think it can be helpful as we recap now just to get us uh, where, we, where we should be. Now, it came about last week because we were talking about the phrase to- a time, times, and half a time, which sounds really confusing until you actually get into what it means and understand it. But I mentioned then that the idea of a time had been previously introduced in the book of Daniel. And here's what I was referring to. So it's the situation that Nebuchadnezzar in his pride needed bringing down to size by God. He was the emperor of the the known world at that time. But God had other other plans. So in 4, in Daniel 4, 32, 33, he told him this. And you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox. And seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men <clears throat> and gives it to whom he will. Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven 
till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. Interesting. So that's pretty harsh to be humbled like that, as from a king to that. And so some kind of insanity took over him, and medically today it's called boanthropy. Like from bovine, that becomes like an animal. So he was disciplined by God. But the reason I bring this up is that the phrase there, periods of time, is the same word so in, in Hebrew, idan, as we read in chapter 7 in the phrase time, times and half a time. So that word is just time. You could say seven times instead of period of time. So basically I think it's safe to conclude that the times used to measure out Nebuchadnezzar's punishment are the same as the times used in chapter 7. Same word by the same author. Now if you weren't here last week, and you've probably never heard, you may have not ever heard this phrase, a time, times and half a time. And if that's you, you're probably going, what on earth are you talking about? So just so we can move forward this week, I'll just tell you that we concluded from the scriptures, as, as well, the best I could from the scriptures, and those who agree with me would agree, that the duration ended up being 1,260 days, which works out if you go like this. So a time, times, that's two, and half a time. So if you do that, it works out to a 360-day year. If you've got 1,260 days under that, it's 360-day years. That's the, each time, which is a measurement of time quite often used in prophetic situations. So essentially, Nebuchadnezzar was out in the field, going back to him again, for seven times, or seven 360-day sections of time, which is a total of 2,520 days. So roughly seven years. And time, times and half a time, or three and a half times, obviously is half of that. So 1,260 days. All right, so we'll use this at the end. So this is why this is helpful now. And the reason for that half measure um, is that when, when we say, like, when we get to the end, you'll see it's two distinct halves this time, we're, this final thing we're talking about. And this agrees with everything we read about the same events in Revelation. And I showed you some of that last week, so this is good for helping Evan and the guys as well as they go through Revelation in their Bible study. So anyway, the point to take from all that is that sevens or weeks, it's the same word, um, just translated in different translations as sevens or weeks. A week is just a group of seven. They are groups of seven 360-day prophetic years. So all of this is one seven, so the whole red bit. That's the length of our measuring stick. So if you think of it like a measuring stick, God's got his measuring stick, and he's, that's what he's using to explain this prophecy here. So if you want to see more discussion of that, go back to last week's message on YouTube channel, um, and you might, if you, if you really want to dig into that. Okay, so to help embed this in our minds, let's get, pick up from Daniel 9, verse 24, where the angel Gabriel delivered to Daniel the prophecy about how God is going to use Israel in the redemption of all things. This is kind of the, that's the biggest picture of what he's doing here. So it's in essence a gospel point being made here. And I'm just going to dive out quickly and say what the full gospel message. Um, what, what's the full gospel? As we said at an earlier time, it's the message of salvation. So that's full salvation, past, present, future, all parts of it. Sent from God the Father embodied in Jesus Christ and especially in his death and resurrection that's the key part so when you get 1 Corinthians 15 definition of the gospel that's the key central, central part of it death and resurrection of Jesus it's illuminated by the Holy Spirit and described in the Bible so that's the gospel we need to get to know better as believers and Daniel 9 relates to all three parts of our salvation past, present and future in various ways and I'll sort of point that out as we go in um, at certain times. So, yep, this is important. So, Daniel 9, verse 24. If, if you want to follow along, that's the place to go. Daniel 9. Gabriel says this. Seventy weeks, or seventy-sevens in some translations, are decreed about your people and your holy city. Okay, so seventy weeks, or literally seventy-sevens, are decreed for the Jews and for Jerusalem. So, that's who this is about. Jews in Jerusalem, and the duration of this prophecy is for 70 of these 7 times 360 day periods. 
So that's 70 times 2,520 days. And for what purpose? That's in verse 24. And to summarise, we'll just say how we concluded from last week. The first one, to finish the transgression. And we saw that last week that was the transgression. In mind was Israel's national rejection of the Messiah, Jesus. So the first purpose listed for the 77s is to change this so that Israel accepts their Messiah, which of course is everyone's saviour, Jesus, right? Same guy. Next, to put an end to sin, that is to turn the nation from being generally sinful into being characterised by obedience and righteousness, which they are certainly not now. So that's not a complete cessation of sin, but it's to make them generally godly. Third, to atone for iniquity. Naturally, we associate this with the cross of Jesus because his blood is the only thing that can fully atone for sin. Next one, to bring in everlasting righteousness. This is to formally inaugurate the millennial kingdom, the kingdom of God. Uh, with Jesus as supreme monarch and it's ascent eternal because even when the thousand years fulfillment of God's promise to David is done then comes the eternal state with everything perfect for eternity beyond that so it's just bringing everlasting righteousness from that time on fifth to seal both vision and, vision and prophet so we left this week this one last week with two options it could be the completion of the canon of scripture that's the first possibility but I think the second option personally is more likely that since God is present in person forevermore in Jesus, there's no need to have visions or prophets anymore. That era is finished. And finally, to anoint a most holy place, that is to establish a holy throne room called the Holy of Holies from which Jesus will reign, I believe. So that's a quick rundown of where we've got so far. That brings us to verse 25. And here we will switch to the NIV, actually, just so you know, since this is one of the rare times, I believe, it translates this much better than the ESV, which obscures the meaning somewhat, the way they, they put it. And the angel Gabriel continues speaking to Daniel. Verse 25, NIV. Know and understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. All right, better pause there. Here Gabriel is outlining two subdivisions within the whole 77s. So one of seven sevens, and then one of 62 sevens. So that makes sense so far, hopefully. But the thing to note here is that the, there are defined beginning and end points of this period of 69 sevens. What's the beginning? Well, it's the, it says there, issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. That's been knocked and damaged and rebuilt multiple times in history, so keep in mind what the context here is. So, um, Daniel is at this moment, as you saw last week, um, and if you read in the section leading up to these verses, he's noticed that the period of Israel's captivity in Babylon was just about up. So we're in, in around uh, mid-6th century BC, was it? Yeah. 500 and something BC and so the nation as a whole was there in Babylon and back home the city and the temple had been destroyed in the takeover when they got all taken out so all that was left there in Israel was pretty much you know rubble and ash and all the things that you know <laughs> is a pile of rubbish so Gabriel is telling Daniel that this period of 77s was going to begin at a specified time in the future because it was not built at that time. And those who are living at that time would be able to identify it by noting that when the ruling power of the day would issue a decree that Israel is allowed to rebuild their city, including, as he says there, streets in a trench. That's just helpful extra information. Now, the word trench, just so you understand, some translate it as wall. Um, the idea is really just to define a boundary. And often it would include either or both of a wall or, and a trench or a moat or something like that. So. so it's just defining the boundary. So when people try and figure out exactly what this is referring to, uh, many seem to get confused because they mistake many earlier decrees, like the famous one from Cyrus that we read about in Ezra chapter 1, as decrees to rebuild the city. 
And I remember walking around the um, precinct at, in Sydney there at the, where they had the Olympics. They've even got a comment about Cyrus <laughs> being sent, you know, letting the, pe- the Jews come back to rebuild then. So it's, it's a, that's a big, big one. But it's not the one. And all the other ones in Ezra are not either because they are in reference to the temple specifically. In fact, there's three separate kings who give their decrees in Ezra. Um, yes, but they all only relate to the temple, not the city, and certainly not including the walls or the boundary of the whole thing. It's only when we get to Nehemiah that we finally get a decree from the king called Artaxerxes, Longimanus, just to be specific, because Artaxerxes is a more general title, to actually rebuild the city. That was why we had the reading we did this morning, so from that. So I'll read just three verses from that to show you. So it's Nehemiah 2, verses 4 to 6. The king said to me, What is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried, this is Jerusalem, so I can rebuild it. Do you notice he prayed before he spoke? I like that. <laughs> That's a good point to keep in mind. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, How long will your journey take, and when will you get back? So it pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. And on we go, and Nehemiah describes then how Artaxerxes gave him letters, and it was all formal and all that. And it certainly meets the criteria of Daniel 9. Because you see in verse 5, there is explicitly, that was to rebuild, rebuild the whole city. And uh, as, as well as after the, and the temple was up and running at this point anyway, or by the time that this decree was given. So it wasn't about the temple so much. So that's the beginning of this prophecy, the day the decree was given. And can we be so bold as to get a date for that? Well, there was an Englishman who asked that question in the late 1800s, and his name was Sir Robert Anderson. He was a criminal investigator with Scotland Yard, so he had uh, you know, the credentials. <laughs> so he was inv- actually involved in the Jack the Ripper investigations. So he was evidently very bright. He looked into this prophecy with the meticulous approach of the man of his profession, but more importantly, with also with the faith of a man who fears God. And I want to point out, you know, his intelligence certainly helped, but it was his faith that was the key to this understanding. Because you have to approach God's word with the faith that it's all true, or you'll miss so much. If you're willing to say, oh, that's, that was probably an error, or that was whatever, you'll miss things. So I pray that can be a lesson for those of us who feel that maybe we're too not smart enough to know anything about you know, God and, and the Bible. No, you're not, you're not silly. It doesn't matter so much about your intelligence. It's more about faith. So it's the eyes of faith that matter. Amen. Amen. So trust God to show you truth by His Spirit. And you'll see Him in ways that you, know, you can pray, praise Him all day long. Because that's, that's what makes, creates praise. Back to Robert Anderson. He was uh, a dedicated believer in Christ as well, if I didn't say that specifically. And his conclusions were published in 1894 in this book. This is not the 1894 version. The Coming Prince, it's called. And uh, to this day, no one has been able to really realistically falsify his work. Now, many take issue with the conclusions for other reasons, but the, the fundamental approach he took and the conclusions he reached, I believe, are quite accurate. I personally would maybe quibble over a day or two here and there, just so you know, and I'm, I'll mention anything relevant as we go. But as for the basic soundness of what he wrote in this book, um, even back over 125 years ago, it's widely seen as a, extremely reliable because he was so diligent. And he also went and confirmed his times and dates with the Royal Observatory, which is you know, the equivalent of perhaps NASA today or whatever. Only I think the Royal Observatory were probably more, more dedicated to facts, I would argue, perhaps, but... NASA's a little interesting these days, they compromise things. But my point is, I believe that when Jesus comes and can explain all this to us, it will at least be very close, if not the same as what Anderson came to those years ago. Now, I'm not worshipping Anderson at all, but just know that I think any, any errors will be from our weakness in figuring it out, or his weaknesses in figuring it out, not God's in what he wrote down. So, the times and the dates I'll give you now are from Anderson's calculations, because um, that's the best we have at the moment. So when was the decree of Artaxerxes? So that first arrow at the bottom there. 
Well, if you want to know how we got there, read the book, and you can borrow it if you like. Um, but I'll cut to the chase and tell you that he fixed it as 14th of March, 445 BC. Obviously going by his own Gregorian calendar, which didn't exist then, but he's pushed it back and applied it to that time, just so we can understand it. And um, there's, uh, there's you know, all the reasoning in, in the book. But I'll note, it's, of course, part of the difficulty when trying to work this out from our day, or even Sir Robert's day, there are lots of tricks, because some overlook the fact that, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but Great Britain's calendar changed in 1752. Anyone know about that? Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that was the year they agreed to change from the old Roman Julian calendar to the Gregorian calendar, which we use today. So, and everyone else had already changed. They just, you know, you know, English. They take their time. Um, so we want to do it our way. But yeah, the reason was that the Julian calendar was getting more out of sync due to slightly different approximations for a year. So it meant that when the changeover happened, 11 days were lost from September 1752. So that Wednesday, the 2nd of September 1752, was followed by Thursday, the 14th of September 1752. And that'd be messed things up, wouldn't it? So any calculation back from our era has to take that into account, as well as all the leap years and everything else. So yes, it's pretty tricky. That's why we mess it up and you know, we hold these things loosely. But like I say, I think the general idea is, is bang on. But Robert Anderson did all that. He went through all this and, like I said, with the help of the Royal Observatory, came up with that date as the start of the prophecy. Okay, so... And we need an exact date because the times involved are exact, right? 360-day years and all that. Okay, so we fixed the beginning. What about the ending? How much later was it? Well, that's why we did all these other um, numbers before. It's 69 sevens later. You have seven sevens, and then 62 sevens, making 69 sevens, right? You can see those you work your way along. Or 483 prophetic 360-day years. There's no reason to assume any gap between them here. And the reason, the question, of course, is asked, and you may be asking, why are there two parts to the 69 sevens? The answer is no one really knows, but ultimately it doesn't affect anything anyway, as far as we can tell um, from where we sit. But the most commonly suggested reason is that it took 49 of those um, times to complete the rebuilding of the city, so the 49 prophetic years to rebuild the city. That's the best guess anyway, and um, it fits the context, so we'll go with that for now. But what we do need to know is what event is that marks the end of the 69 sevens. Because it says there, what is it? Until the anointed one, the ruler comes. So there we go. Now the word anointed one there is literally in Hebrew, Mashiach, which we transliterate as what? Messiah. So it's until... In the, Messiah is not always the Messiah in every context, but in this context, it clearly is. So that's until the Messiah comes. So it's just until he turns up, right? Messiah comes? Well, sort of. We need to be careful because there's a qualifier there, isn't there? It's because when he comes as ruler, and some translations say prince, and he formally presents himself as such, not just when he comes as a baby. So when was that? When did he present himself as ruler? Well, Robert Anderson did the maths on that, calculating the, now here we go, this is a nice big number, 69 sevens, 69 sevens, 69 times seven, times 360 days, and he got 173,880 days. That's how long the 69 sevens lasted, which takes us from 14th of March, 445 BC, to 6th of April, 32 AD. And if you didn't know that was... 173,980 days before, now you do. So it's really important. <laughs> no. Well, it's important if you're working this out. So what happened on the April the 6th, 32 AD? Well, Anderson argued very well that this was the triumphal entry of Jesus, which fits pretty well, doesn't it, from what the description there is in Daniel? And for me, this just, this just blows me away. It's the precision of God's word. And it does make me wonder, you know all those times when Jesus said, my time has not yet come. And how when we were going through Luke, we noticed that Jesus you know, set his face to go to Jerusalem because he had basically had an appointment to fulfill there. I do wonder if 
knowing this was how he could say those kind of things with confidence, perhaps, you know, he, he knew it. Of course, the cross was the key moment of the appointment, but it was the triumphal entry just a few days before that that kicked off what we often call the Passion Week of Jesus, that Passover time, as he fulfilled that symbol of the lamb that had been sacrificed uh, by the Jews for the previous 1,500 odd years uh, by becoming the final one, or the final necessary one, the one and only acceptable sacrifice for our sins, which is incidentally is... Uh, also part of the 77's prophecy. That's the bit we call the past aspect of salvation, so our justification in his blood. So let's see, verse 26. It comes up next. So after the 62 sevens, hold on, I thought we just had 69 sevens. But I hope you can see that all he's saying is that he's specifically talking about the latter division of the 69 weeks there. So after the 62 sevens, so there. So we're just past the edge of the 69th seven. Presumably into the 70th week, right? But we'll hold that idea that we're now in the 70th seven loosely until we can get become a bit more sure. So we'll just we'll go with that for now. So next bit. The anointed one, so after the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. So just so you're aware, cut off in Hebrew thought, is it's the way of saying to be killed. And again, the one in view is the anointed one, which is again is the word Messiah, Messiah Jesus. So Gabriel is saying that the Messiah who had just come as ruler will then be killed and have nothing. And some translations say, but not for himself, which would make pretty good sense of his death, right? <laughs> it was sacrificed for us as a substitute for our sins, but really it does seem more accurate in the Hebrew to say have nothing, actually. So he may simply be referring to his material and social poverty because you know, he was betrayed and he was abandoned by everyone at his death. We, we can't be 100% sure, but that, that's what it's talking about there. Now we need to be careful with this next bit, so as we continue on with verse 26. So the people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, of course, many see this as the same ruler that we've just been talking about, the Messiah Jesus. But I think that's a mistake. The prophecy is talking about stuff going on as it happens, kind of just recounting as if it was watching time go by. So we've just been talking about a ruler, but this one is still to come. So this other ruler we've been talking about has come in the prophecy, talking about one still to come. And even when it's talking about his people and what they do, he's he's still described as future when these people doing this thing the he still will come in other words hey there's going to be a future ruler coming and his people presumably from from the nation he's from or but it could also be his spiritual type perhaps those people are going to destroy this city and this sanctuary again because remember at the time he spoke it already was destroyed so um, but Gabriel just said a couple of verses back would be rebuilt so this is definitely talking about a different ruler than the Messiah, especially when you lay alongside history and see that people who destroyed the city and the temple were the Romans in 70 AD, although it may be relevant to note that the actual people that Rome used to attack Jerusalem were in fact Arabs and Syrians, so just that's something to keep in mind for those who dig deeper into this. But that, um, that, that's important because it's this verse that many used to say that the Antichrist who we can conclude is the coming ruler in view here. I don't have time to explain all that. Um, and that becomes, it does become more clear as we go, that the Antichrist and his system must be Roman, they say, and there will be a revived Roman Empire. That's what one view is, but um, if you see exactly who destroyed the temple is not necessarily Roman, you have to th just keep options open. But as we saw a few weeks back, Rome was only, like I said, part of that final beast, and the real enemy is the spirit of totalitarianism. So we need to be careful not to jump to conclusions about the Antichrist being Western European necessarily. So okay, the city of Jerusalem, obviously including the temple, was destroyed by those under control of the Roman Empire who were, who are, in this case, the people of the ruler who will come. Not Jesus, but the spirit of this final ruler is behind this destruction. That's 
coming in Daniel's, looking ahead from Daniel's time. Now there's something else you may have noticed here. It's a matter of history that this happened, and when did we say it was? 70 AD. Now if we're in our last seven at this time, there's a problem, because as the arrow there shows, 70 AD is 38 normal years past where we ended the 69th seven. To be part of the 70th seven, this destruction of the city would have to have happened sometime before the end of, so about 39 AD. So this is the first sign that perhaps we're talking about a gap in the 70 weeks, because it's specifically after the 69th week, but it's too long after to fit in the 70th if they are contiguous. See what I'm saying? So what do we do with that? Something doesn't add up. Well, let's just hold that thought and we'll get back to seeing the operation of the spirit of the Antichrist, the spirit of totalitarianism as we read on, verse 26. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end and desolations have been decreed. So the language there is quite expansive, isn't it? And it seems to reflect a fair period of time. So the flood in view there seems to refer to the overpowering of Jerusalem, which history tells us leads to a long period of dispersion of the Jewish people um, which was formerly called the Diaspora, and that's the title we give it. But the land will be warring and des desolate um, for whoever is there. It's going to be have trouble and, and, and dry and nothing there much. It says there, until the end of time. Oh, sorry, until the end time, not until the end of time. Until the end, end comes. Which is a great description of what the, the state of Israel has been like up until recent times. has been desolate. And Mark Twain, he famously went through and said, there's nothing here. But things have changed now. Israel is back in the land, officially as of 1948. And so we're really forced to conclude from both scripture and from history that the 70th week is still coming. So there must be a gap, a quite a long one, after the 69th seven. And I've noted here that much of the time the land of Israel was desolate. Just put that in there, the desolation of the land. And so now the prophecy gets to that final missing seven, which is going to round off all the purposes for Israel that God outlined back in verse 24. Because remember, that's what this is all about. As we go to verse 27. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. Okay, so who is he? Well, grammatically, it's whoever the most recent person referred to. And that is the Antichrist, as we've been talking about him since the middle of verse 26. So his people destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. His people, whatever that means exactly. But now he comes in person for the final seven. And just to be clear, no, this has not happened yet because uh, well, because it, for it to happen, there has to be a functioning nation of Israel with predominantly Jewish people living in it, something that's only been true for the last 70 years or so. So what will he do now he's, the, now he's actually come? Not that he's coming like we saw before. He's actually here now in verse 27. He will confirm, or to be more precise, the word is to enhance or increase a covenant. So what that means is there'll be some kind of treaty or agreement with many, the many there, whoever they are, maybe surrounding nations, and it will be for one seven, which is how long? Seven prophetic years, so 2,520 days. When we put this all together with the rest of Scripture, we see that this is describing something we call the tribulation. And the word tribulation means trouble. Hence, it's also called the time of Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Jacob being another name for Israel, because the, the patriarch Jacob was also renamed Israel, and from him came the 12 tribes and all that. So that's why Jacob and Israel are synonymous there. And we're about to see a little of what it, that involves as we go further in verse 27. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. Aha, so here's where we see the reason why we keep encountering the, you know, the time, times and half a time thing in the Bible and why it's 1260 days. It's because there are two distinct halves for this final seven of 1260 days each. And it turns out, just to cut a long story short, that in the first half it will seem like the Antichrist is on good terms with the nation of Israel. And many presume this means that as 
part of the treaty with the many who allow Israel to rebuild their temple because it has to be standing by the middle of the seven for him to put an end to sacrifice and offering and commit the abomination of desolation because it has to happen in the temple. So we're going to read about that next. So he's been fairly nice to them in the beginning, but at the exact middle point, so 1260 days in, he'll double cross them and desecrate their temple, which we see as we read on verse on in verse 27. So on the wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. So that's just uh, a skim through the last half of the tribulation, that little part there, the final 1260 days of the prophecy. And I apologize, I didn't necessarily skip over an awful lot to get through this in time today, but because there are so many things that come out of this prophecy, it's not funny. But let's answer this question. Why does this 77s have to happen? Well, that takes us back to verse 24, doesn't it? The purpose was clearly outlined there. But maybe we can state the purpose in a more of a summary form. In a nutshell, it's to bring the nation of Israel to its knees so they finally recognize their Savior, Jesus, and cry for him to return to save them. And I can show you Zechariah 12.10 again. That was last week, which describes the nation's remorse at missing Jesus the first time. But I think it's even clearer if we go to Hosea 5. So in there, Hosea 5, God is showing that he's actually behind the extreme difficulties of this time. Yes, it's the last piece of Nebuchadnezzar's dream doing this, but it's all working for God's plan. Just how, like how God often uses evil people and nations to achieve his purposes. That's, that's frequently in scripture. So we read Hosea 5, 14 and 15, Yahweh speaking, For I will be like a lion to Ephraim, like a great lion to Judah. That's north and south kingdoms there, Ephraim and Judah. I will tear them to pieces and go away. I will carry them off with no one to rescue them. Then I will go back to my place until they admit their guilt. They will seek, and they will seek my face. In their misery, they will earnestly seek me. So what that's saying is God is waiting for Israel to repent and call for him before he comes back. Then the Antichrist is going to get what's coming. It's poured out on him by Jesus. Which does explain why Satan is still so intent um, on destroying the Jews even today. Because if he can wipe them out, then they can't invite Jesus to return. And that's also fundamental to understand as we get to the rest of this series, especially towards the end, but which is only a few weeks away, I think. We'll see. <laughs> All right, so there you go. That's the 77's prophecy in a fairly condensed form, believe it or not. So just to wrap up, let me put what we've just seen in context with the dreams we looked at a couple of sermons back. First, this is the chart we had before. I know it looks complicated, but I just built it up step by step last time. Um, but it's just it's an overall view of the Gentile empires, which will be in charge over, over Israel from the time of Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel onwards. And now we can add the 77's prophecy underneath there, focus on Israel there in green. And you can see they happen concurrently. Now, I'm not setting a date at the end there. It's just somewhere there, question mark. Um, it might be soon, but we don't know. Now, as, that, as we said, that final seven is still coming, and it could be very close. But one thing's certain, it is coming. The empires of this world are going to give way to the kingdom of God. And now that we have this backbone prophecy in place, we are better equipped to see our way forward more clearly from our day as well. Are we preparing our hearts in faith by seeking God more intently? That's the, that's the question we need to ask ourselves. Are we preparing? Because as Jesus repeatedly warns us, we mustn't get caught napping before the end begins. Not that we go, I don't believe we go through the tribulation period. I do believe the church is caught up before this final seven, hence avoiding all the horrible evils of this period of time. But today's not the day to deal with that. But if that is true, then it's even more critical to be ready since the day is even closer. And I think we can certainly see the clouds gathering for that final storm. So let's, uh, let's do Hebrews 10, 24, 25. Let's do this in our, our church life. This is my go-to passage for 2020, I think. Let us consider how we may spur one another, towards, uh, one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So that last time 
it has a, it's the day of the Lord is another title for it. So let's do that and let's do that as we have our morning tea later on and beyond. Let's pray. Lord, your word is uh, <laughs> amazing to us. We know we haven't necessarily got everything figured out, but we thank you that you do and that we can trust you with everything and that you will take care of us. So thank you for your spirit with us, your son who died for us, and that you love us enough to show us these things. So we pray and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.